tribal period. There is not so much now this family issue, the sons of of Isaac or the sons of Jacob Israel or the sons of Joseph, it's tribal. So it's the the tribes start to form. That's why we notice, remember, when they go out into the wilderness wanderings, the tribes settle around the tabernacle. It's not the families, it's the tribes. They've become tribes, they become tribes in those four hundred years in Egypt. Uh, slavery. And again, if you go four hundred years back, we're at the time when the Mayflower is getting ready to set sail to come to America. That day to now is 400 years. So they were in Egypt for 400 years. And during that time, they went from being family to tribal. It's the tribal period. The next 400 years starts with the Exodus. So it starts with the Exodus, and that's no longer the family period. It's not the tribal period. It's that theocracy period. Remember the Exodus? They go to Mount Sinai, and God says, okay, here's, the, here's what it is. Here's the covenant. And they agree. And they said, okay, we will now follow God. He will be our king. So it's the theocracy. God is the ruler of the nation of Israel. So it's no longer about the tribes. It's about the nation of Israel coming under God's rule. It starts with the Exodus, and it goes all the way to the very first king, Saul. We remember at the beginning of this theocratic period, God said there's going to come a time when you're going to go into the land and you're going to want to have a king like all the other nations and make sure you do that. Remember in Deuteronomy 17 we saw it there. Make sure he's a man of the book. Make sure he doesn't multiply horses in Egypt. Make sure he doesn't multiply gold. And um, they just give him, make sure he doesn't multiply wives because it'll turn his heart. The very thing that Solomon does. But during this time is when God is supposed to be sovereign over his people. The period of Judges, 350 years, they're rebelling big time already. So it's really just this time in the wilderness and that second generation that follows Joshua into the land. There's where we see a truly theocratic nation. Now in the book of Judges, we're going to see, instead of following God, check this out, everyone does what's right in their own eyes. That's the theme, one of the themes of the book of Judges. Everyone does what's right in their own eyes. So it's interesting in our own nation when we look at it, you know, we say we're a nation under God. A nation under God would follow God. I didn't see a lot of prayer meetings prior to this election. Let's get together and let's see if we can get 80 million people to gather together and pray to see what God would have us do. No, we all vote for who we think is right either in our own eyes or in a political pundit's eyes, but not in God's eyes. We don't even seek God on this for the most part. And that's what was going on in the nation or in, in the promised land at this time. For these 350 years, they were really looking at what was right, what they felt was best for them. But it was supposed to be a theocracy. Then they said, we want a king like all the other nations around us. So God gives them a king from the tribe of Benjamin. And we're going to see at the end of Ruth's study tonight why it wasn't from the tribe of Judah. There's a very good reason. A very good reason. I personally believe if they would not have asked for King Saul, David would have been given to them by God from the tribe of Judah. And we'll see why tonight as we look at it. So they're asking for a king ahead of God's plan, cost him Saul. And uh, we know the story of Saul. It got really ugly really quick. But Saul, from Saul, King Saul, the first king, all the way to the last king, King Zedekiah, and the exile to Babylon, the Babylonian captivity, that's another 400 years. So we see during these 1,600 years from the birth of Abraham to the Babylonian captivity, 400 years, 400 years, 400 years, 400 years. Anybody know how many years it was between the Testaments? From the Old Testament to the New Testament? 400 years. Isn't that something? There's another 400 years. Wouldn't it be interesting to see what took place from the year basically 4 B.C. or so to the year 400 in church history? Those of you in church history, check it out. Might be fun to check what happens at 800 and at 1200 and at 1600 about. Oh, there we hit the Reformation. And after 1600 comes now. It's just interesting. People of prophecy like it a lot. But it's just interesting. We're living at a time when something should happen in the Christian realm somewhere around here. Something's about to happen. 
Yeah. So what's the period of time for the last 400 years? It's called the monarchy period. I'm sorry, monarchy period. It's when they have kings, the last 400 years, when kings rule in Israel. So Israel is identified for the first 400 years by being family, the family of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, the patriarchs. The next 400 years, tribes. The next 400 years, the theocracy. The next 400 years, the monarchy. So those are those first 1,600 years. Following that, we then get to this inner testamental period soon. There's a little bit of a break, and then we, we hit those 400 years. It's just, it's, it's just interesting. Judges were actually now, again, occasional deliverers raised up by God to rescue Israel from oppression and to administer justice. That's what a judge would do. So in times of peace, he was like our judge. But the fun stories are when there wasn't times of peace. I mean, a three-sentence history of a judge, he was judge for 12 years, and he rode on donkeys with his 30 kids, each having a donkey. That's the story. But then you get to Samson. Oh, man, there's a story. He was a loser judge, but he started what God called him to do. He was a he-man with a she-problem. And every chapter we see him struggling with these, most people believe, Philistine women. But it's much more enticing reading than three verses about a guy riding around on a donkey. But the donkey periods were periods where they administered justice. In the book of Judges, the theme that is going to cry out at us is failure through compromise. It's what we see in the book of Judges. They compromise. God said, destroy the inhabitants of the land. Men, women, children, and animals. Kill them. They compromised. They didn't follow completely. They followed a little bit, but not completely. And because of their compromise, bad things happen over the next 350 years. So it's failure through compromise. As we look at the book of Judges, think of a secular pattern, a cycle. It's a four-part cycle. I'm going to go backwards. So it's like, think of it like a clock. You're looking at an old clock right here. On the top of the clock, life is good. And they're living their life. But over from 12 o'clock noon, let's say, to 3 o'clock on that clock, they fall into sin. And that's what you're going to see as you read through the book of Judges, is they're doing well, and then in some pocket they fall into sin. As a result from their sin, from 3 o'clock to 6 o'clock, God brings, and it tells us, God rose, brought up different groups of their surrounding nations to bring them under servitude, or I always think of suffering. So they start at the top, and they experience sin from noon to 3. Then from 3 to 6, suffering. God raises up people to put them in slavery. While they're down there suffering at 6 o'clock, they cry out to God. And that's what you keep saying. And the children of Israel cried out to God. I call it supplication. I'm getting them all S's, that's why. Supplication from 6 to 9. And then God brings about salvation from 9 to midnight through a judge, a different judge. And that's the circle. They're on top. Life is good. They've been, it's good. They fall into sin, to, to suffering, to supplication, to salvation. And that's the book of Judges. Sin, suffering, supplication, salvation. The salvation part is where the judges come in. The suffering or the servitude is where we put the different nation that God raises up to put the children of Israel under servitude. And in there, those tell them for how many years. So the first judge that we see in the book of Judges is a guy named Othniel. He's a nephew of Caleb. And the children of Israel fall into sin in chapter 3. And they, God raises up a king. You don't have to know this king, but yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. It's one of the coolest names. I don't have it in my notes. It's one of these names that sticks in your head and you can't get rid of it because it's just, it's cool. I always, I always think of it as 
Well, the, the name of the king you want to remember, the king of Mesopotamia, the first one in the book of Judges that God raises up. He's from Mesopotamia, and God raises him up. His name is Cushan Rishathaim. That's just a cool name. He's one of the Rithathaim boys. So you got the Rithathaims. It's that Rithathaim family in Mesopotamia. Rithathaim. That's his name. You know, there goes a neighbor. The Rithathaims are moving in. You know, it's the Rithathaims. Well, Cushan is the, the oldest brother. And he rises up. I'm just making this up, guys. But that's how you're going to remember it. So it's Cushan Rishathaim. And he comes up. God raises him up out of Mesopotamia. And he comes up and he puts the children of Israel that are caught in sin under servitude. And for eight years, they're under bondage to old Cushan Rishathaim. It doesn't say for sure what he does. We just know Cushan Rishathaim, just the way it sounds. <laughs> Let me pull it up here. C U S H A N, Kushan dash, Rish R I S H, A T H A I M, Kushan Rishathaim. That's just a cool name. I just love that name. I learned that the first time when I was teaching a Bible study up in North Dakota. It's one of those names that just stuck with me, and I, I, I love the name. It's just a cool name. What do you think you are, Kushan Rishathaim? It's just a fun, fun name. It's Kushan Rishathaim. It's cool. It'll get you in a fight, so don't say it necessarily, but it's a good name. Here's how, it's, here's, how, here's how it reads in the book of Judges. So the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Uh-oh, there's their sin, right? That circle, there's their sin. They did evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God. Uh-oh. And they served the Baals and the Asherahs. Sexual sin. So they got sexual sin, and they're trusting in the Baals for their provision rather than their God. Therefore, because they did that, therefore the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia. And the children of Israel served Cushan Rishathaim eight years. There's the servitude part. You see that? When the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, there's a supplication. The Lord raised up a deliverer for the children of Israel. There's a salvation. Who delivered them? Othniel, the son of Kenaz, who was Caleb's younger brother, Caleb's nephew. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him. There it is, see? There he comes upon him. He raised him up. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel. He went out to war, and the war delivered Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand. And his hand prevailed over Cushan Rishathaim. So the land had rest for 40 years. So now... Othniel is the judge of that area. And then after then, then Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. So he delivered him, and then he judged. He, he just administered justice there. See how that works? There's the first circle. That's the first judge, Othniel, the nephew of Caleb, delivered the children of Israel from the eight-year servitude of Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia. That's one. There's going to be six of them that you have to know for next week's quiz. That's one. It's not so bad. You find that in chapter 3. Chapter 3 of Judges, verses 7 through 11. I'm not saying you have to, but if it were me, I would read that. I would read the textbook, but I would definitely read that text. Between the text and the textbook, you'll be fine. The next judge picks up in the very next verse, which is very rare. This is one of my favorite judges. This guy is crazy. His name is Ehud. Ehud, the judge. His account is just right here in chapter 3, verses 12 through 30. But what's cool about Ehud is Moab. The Moabites, they raise up. And the Moabites put the children of Israel, well, here's what it says. The children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. There's their sin. So the Lord strengthened Eglon. That was the kings of Moab, old Eglon. Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. Then he gathered to himself, old Eglon did, the people of Ammon and Amalek. They went and defeated Israel. So you have a Moab, Ammon, and Amalek coalition, and they take possession of the city of Palms. That's Jericho. So Jericho was destroyed, and then it was rebuilt. When you go to Israel today, we stop at Jericho. That's where we rode the camel, in Jericho. But we didn't go to the ruins of Jericho, remember? There's two cities of Jericho. There's the ancient 
Jericho that got destroyed. You can go to the ruins. There they are. We can't go there now because of political tensions. And then there's the newer city of Jericho. And that comes into play in the Gospels, guys. It's very interesting. Jesus comes through there on his way to Jerusalem to the cross. It's where he heals uh, blind Bartimaeus. And in one of the Gospels, it says as he was entering, no, as he was leaving Jericho, he met the blind men. And another Gospel says as he was entering Jericho, he met the blind men. And critics go, aha, that's why you cannot trust the Word of God. What is it? Is he going in or is he coming out? What is it? Two blind men, but there's two Jerichos. There's the old Jericho that was rebuilt a little bit and they're living around. And then there's the new Jericho. So we know it took place between the two Jerichos. As he's leaving the one, there's the blind man. As he entered the other one, he saw the blind man. And there are two blind men. One gospel account just talks about Bartimaeus. The other one says about two blind men. So it's just an interesting account. But the more you study the word, you find that there are not discrepancies. It means we have to study more. But the liberal will quickly look at it and say, aha, and throw the baby out with the bathwater. No, study more, and you'll see it comes to life. It's pretty interesting. This is the, new, the start of the new Jericho now, the city of Palms. So they come in and they take it over. Not the one that was destroyed, not that outpost, but this new one now that's been built up. So they come and they take it over, it says. So the children of Israel served Eglon, king of Moab, for 18 years. Now remember, this is not in chronological order, and that's very important. We don't know if this took place 200 years after Othniel. We don't know. Or did it happen at the same time? We don't know. It's not chronological. It just gives these accounts of these judges. So here it is. Now when we look at this, this Ehud decides to go in to Eglon. Now, back in the day, you would check for weapons. Their secret service, Eglon's secret service, people have their weapon on their, on their left side because you'd grab your weapon. Ehud, talk about a brave dude, took his dagger and he hit it on his right side. A, a long dagger, 18-inch dagger. And he hides it on his right side. He goes in to talk to the king, Eglon. Security checks him, go in. The accounts in, the, in Judges here. He goes in and meets the king, comes to shake the king's hand. He's left-handed. He grabs his dagger, and it says he took that blade and he shoved it into his gut all the way up to the handle, 18 inches. Mm. It tells us in there that Eglon is a really fat king. He ate a lot of eggs. Old Eglon. So there he was. So he's, got, he's just a fat dude. And he buries that sword into Eglon. Takes him out. Goes out the back window and he's out. Secret Service guys, we're standing out front, pacing. I don't know. What's he doing? I don't know. It's been a long time. I don't know. What's going on? It's gone. I don't know. No, he didn't go out the front. I think he went out the front door. That's what he did. He had came out and said, see you guys. Thanks. And they're waiting. Well, he's not coming out. The door's closed. So we're just waiting. And so maybe he's relieving himself. We don't know. Because I thought, that's interesting. A big dude. Maybe it might take a while. And they're waiting. In the meantime, he heads out. He gets back home, blows a trumpet. Let's go. Rallies a troop. They open the door. There's their king dead on the floor. Ehud delivers them from the Moabite Ammonite uh, coalition and uh, a Midianite coalition, not Midianite, uh, Amalek coalition. So that's the second judge, Ehud. So we say the same thing if you read through it, and I encourage you as you read through these accounts, I would read them. Look for that cycle. Sin, servitude, suffering, whatever you want to call it, supplication, salvation. And you keep getting this circle. You just keep in this circle. You keep getting this circle. It amazes me they waited 18 years to cry out to God before he rose up Ehud. I wonder what would have happened if they had just cried out after 18 hours. I believe God would have raised up a deliverer. But it's amazing, is it not, how many times we see in our own life we wait and wait and wait until we, before we cry out to God? It's a hard marriage. I can do this. I'm just going to do it. Cry out to God for crying out loud. Cry out to God. He'll raise up and deliver. He'll, he'll heal your marriage. Got a tough relationship? Cry out to God. You got a tough work situation? Cry out to God. It's amazing how long we try to rely on our flesh. 18 years. 18 years. They cry out to God. And God says, okay, let's do this. Bam. Done. Pretty cool. Now it goes on. 
It goes into the next one in chapter 4. And chapter 4 is a sad situation. It says, this is really close to Ehud. It says, when Ehud was dead, the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord sold them into the hand of another Jabin. Remember, Jabin's not his name. It's a title. Like Pharaoh, Caesar, President Jabin. So he, so he sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who raised again, he, he reigned again in Hazor. The commander of his army was a guy named Sisera, who dwelt in a town called Herosheth Hagoim. The children of Israel cried out to the Lord after 20 years. For Jabin had 900 chariots of iron, and for 20 years he had harshly oppressed the children of Israel. What's interesting, there's no man in all of Israel to respond. So God calls out a woman to judge, Deborah. And there's a principle there in any fellowship. And I don't know what it is. I just believe women have a greater sensitivity to the things of God. I really do. Um, typically, if you do a women's Bible study, you do a men's Bible study, there's seven, typically. It's just, women are just sense, more sensitive, it seems. But if you get a man on fire, look out. But women are much quicker, it seems, to just be sensitive. But if a man does not rise up, God will raise up a woman and use her. Deborah's a prime example. So, Deborah rises up. She talks to the commander of Israel. His name is Barak. And she says, Barak... I want you to go up and lead the children of Israel. We're going to take out this Jabin. And he goes, ho, 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 ho. Uh, <laughs> I'll go up only if you go up with me, Deborah. You hold my hand, I'll go. How sad it is when men won't be men. And Barak said, or Barak said, I'll, I'll go up, but only if you go with me. And she said, really? You know what? You know what, Barak? You're going to have victory, but you're not going to get the glory. A woman's going to get the glory. So you read that and you go, oh, Deborah's going to get the glory. This is going to be awesome. And if you're skimming, you're going to see chapter 5 is called the Song of Deborah. Obviously, Deborah's going to get the glory. Well, they go up. They have this big battle. It rains. All the chariots get stuck in the mud. And it's interesting. Israel always sees rain as a blessing all the, all the time. So what a blessing. God sticks those 900 chariots in the mud. They get out and start fighting. Israel's coming in. They take off. Sisera, the main general of the Jabin, the main guy, He's in trouble. He takes off running, and he, he goes to a tent of a Kenite. The Kenites were always hanging around, and they were kind of friends with everybody. They just got along with everybody. Whoever's there that day, that's my buddy, you know. And there she is, and her name is J.L. And J.L. was just a gal, J-A-E-L, and she was just there. And here comes the commander of the Jabin's army, this coalition of the north with all these from battle. He comes running in. He says, Whew, they're after me. I need, to, I, need some, I, need, I need to rest. Let me sleep in your tent for a while. i got to take a break. I, I need some place to sleep tonight. So she says, here, have some milk. Here's a nice place to lay down. He lays down. And you see.